Hey folks, Todd Coleman here with your Aerospace Structure Series. This is Lecture 3 for Mechanics and Composites class. We ended our last lecture looking at a lamina, which means we're looking at a layer. And today we're dealing with macro mechanics, which means we just want to know how this thing behaves as a whole, and we're dealing with the lamina itself. Now we already saw the lamina can have behavior that can be linear elastic or elastoplastic or can be a normal stress strain curve or any number of other things. But when we're dealing with a lamina, we're going to assume that it has linear elastic behavior. This is going to keep our work a little more uh, easy to manage and it's a reasonable enough approximation for most engineering work. Okay, we need to understand the concepts of space, one space. If we have a single axis, so if we're just driving along a straight line on a road, we can go forward or backwards. Two space, now in a plane, we can move up, down, side to side. Three spaces, now a three-dimensional kind of issue. Four spaces, start adding time or something else. We need to understand the concepts of three space so that we can uh, deal with the principles we're going to be needing here. This, when we start talking about three space, we uh, are going to use terms like direction, what direction are we going, and points. We can actually take two points and define the direction, as we saw in statics uh, in our earlier studies. We're going to actually be dealing with tensors. Now we did some, uh, we, ha we have another little a little uh, video on matrix uh, operations. Remember, tensors are just a tool that engineers use to keep track of multi-directional space and other things. So this little scalar A, if we just have a variable A, that's typically a scalar. It has a single value. We can use tensor notation, or at least in tensor notation, that's true. We can use A to, with one indice to indicate a vector. Now we can have multiple values in that. We can have a one-dimensional vector, a two-dimensional vector, that would be an AIJ, a three-dimensional vector, IJK, and so forth. So we can see five, once again here, that's a scalar, but this little five, three, two, semicolon, three, three, two, that's the next row, if you go back to our matrix notation or MATLAB videos, we'll talk about that. And our three, four, five, third row, that is a three by three matrix. That is a, uh, IJ has two subscripts because we have a row subscript, the I being each row, the J subscript being each column. Now, if we had a series of, of uh, planar matrices, IJ matrices, one after the other, like a bunch of transparencies sitting on top of each other, that would be that third indice there. This little this compliance matrix I'm showing here is a three by three, but that is a two indice because we only need two indices to find those terms. The I, which is identifying the row number, and the J, which is identifying the column number. So that is a second order tensor. Okay? This little vector of strains is a vector because we only need one indice. It's got three rows, one column. If it had three rows, two columns, it would need a two, a second order, an ij, but since it only has a single row, that's actually just a single element. We could just define them as a one, two, three kind of value. Okay? So we studied uh, tensors way back in 3261 where we looked at a little stress element and we looked at the faces. If we focus here, we could use X, Y, Z. That's probably what we did back before. We could also use 1, 2, 3, U, V, J, whatever. Um, if we focus on the one face, that face is perpendicular. The normal is perpendicular to the face and the normal of the area is acting in the one direction. So our tensor that we use for that stress that's acting on that one face, we'll call that stress one for the normal is in the one direction, 
And if the stress is already also in the same direction, that's another one. So 1-1, one, one, stress 1-1, one, one, is actually a stress on the one face, the, the face that has the area that has a normal, it's in the one direction, in the one direction. The stress is in the one direction also, therefore it's a 1-1. One, one. A lot of times, sloppy nomenclature will condense that and just say it's sigma-1, and it's implied that that is a 1-1 one, one stress. Now we, on the other hand, we could see our shear stress, tau-1-2. See that on the one face? So that stress acts on the one face again, the face that has a normal in the one direction, but the stress is actually acting in the two direction. Since the stress is parallel to the face, it's called a shear stress. And we'll often give it the tau as a symbol. But if we're using tensor notation, we don't need to call that tau. We can still use sigma because that stress, it's on a face, and a diff, and uh, the, 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 the one face, but the, the stress value is parallel to the face in the other direction, the two direction. Hence that, by definition, that one two is a shear stress. So we need to understand this kind of nomenclature. And remember, uh, shear stresses are kissing cousins. They're always mouth to mouth and toe to toe. And the magnitude of the two little arrows is the same. So stress 1, 2 is a strain same as stress 2, 1. On the other hand, if we look at the 3 phase, we see sigma 3, 3 is a stress on the 3 phase. It has a face with a normal in the 3 direction and the stress in the 3 direction. Since the, the face and the normal and the stress are in the same direction, that's called a normal stress. However, stress 3, 2 is on the 3 face in the 2 direction excuse me, 3, 2 is going this way on the 3 face in the 2 direction. And since those two indices are different, that's a shear stress, since the stress is parallel to the face, and we see those kissing cousins. So we use tensor notations when we start getting to more complicated stress states. What we did before was mostly looking at just an axial load or just a shear stress, and usually not combined or simply uh, easily rotated within, but now as we start looking at three-dimensional stresses, we're going to need tensors to define them and keep track of what we're talking about. It actually is easier than it sounds, so don't let your fear grab a hold of you and keep you from learning that idea. Okay? Now remember we learned about Hooke's Law. The stress is equal to the modulus of elasticity times the strain this was true for isotropic materials, and this was really only valid in the linear range. We also we looked at an extending bar when we dealt with that. We plotted the, the stress-strain curve, and we also saw that the area underneath the stress-strain curve is just the energy per unit volume, just like the area under the load deflection curve was the energy the area under the stress-strain curve is the energy per unit volume. We talked about that in arrow 3261 in our Structures 1 class. All of this is limited. When we use Hooke's Law like this, stress equals EE, we're limiting ourselves to linear elastic behavior. And while a lot of times we're dealing with behavior that goes beyond that, actually the loads that our structures are designed for are usually occurring within that range, although we do a lot of ultimate analysis where we're going out all the way to failure. Well, the reason we can get away with ignoring that plastic behavior is because when we do that kind of analysis, we're using one and a half times. Usually we have a factor of safety embedded in our loads, so we're dealing with stresses that are one and a half times the biggest they could ever possibly be, so we can keep our analysis simple and still properly characterize our material. Okay, now if we did the same thing for shear stress as we did in our Structures 1 class, we find out that the shear stress is related to the shear strain with the shear modulus, G. Okay, once again, we're talking isotropic materials, we're talking linear elastic behavior. Okay?
just a real quick look now if I'm going to go over this fast so you may need to go back to your structures one videos and review but remember when we have a uh, when we our strain is defined as the deflection per unit length so the strain in the one direction is the u dx the deflection in the x direction over the original length in the x direction the strain in the two direction is the deflection in the y direction over the original length in the y direction, and so on. And we did the same thing for shear strains, where if we have a little, here's a little pure shear element. If we look at that shear, we have a little pure shear element. We apply a shear stress, and it deforms like this, which means we're getting a little deflection. This deflection over that length is a shear strain, and this deflection over this length is a shear strain. And if we want to understand where did this point go under this deflection, we're going to need to understand that little strain right here, which happens to be about half of the total strain of the element. If we want to look at how much is this element straining so we can figure out how much stress, we're going to need to add those together. To try and put this really simply, the difference between true strain or tensor strain and engineering strain is this. When we're dealing with true strain, we need to do that, tensor strain, when we're trying to figure out precisely where things are going. Under the straining, we need to only deal with the strain that applies to that point. But if we want to relate stresses to strain, we need to take the entire strain on the material and then translate it to a stress. We can uh, investigate this by imagine, grab your buddy's arm, and his right arm, and twist it in an Indian burn style. If we want to understand, uh, he's going to get irritated, right? Because we've just deformed him. But if we do that to one arm, that will cause some irritation. If we do it to both arms simultaneously, now he's twice as irritated. Okay? If we want to know how much is this dude irritated, how much stress are we causing, we're going to need to add both those twisting effects together. Just like we need to do with engineering strain, we need both strains if we want to relate how much total stress is caused by the strain. Okay? But if we want to know where did his arm go under this twisting action, we'd only want to deal with the straining on that arm or the twisting on that arm to do that. And that's why we need tensor strains for some things and engineering strains for others. Engineering strains when we're relating stress to strain. We did the same thing in finite elements class composites, final elements class, and many higher classes that you might encounter are going to need to understand both tensor strain, which we also can call true strain, and our engineering strain, okay? So these are the total strains on the material. We can drill this down just a little bit further. Here, this is trying to make that comparison again a little further, looking at the shear stress on the element. The first one here is the engineering strain. The second one is half that. That's the true strain, and or tensor strain, we're going to call it. And we're going to use, to differentiate these two, we're going to use gamma for the engineering strain and epsilon for the true strain or tensor strain, okay? So don't forget that nomenclature. This little table out of Jones down here at the lower left is convenient. You'll notice we have stress 1, 1, stress 2, 2, stress 3, 3. Those are normal stresses. Stress 2, 3, 3, 1, and 1, 2 are all shear stresses, which, and like we talked about, it doesn't actually need to be called tau. We know it's a shear strain since the indices are a different, a different uh, number, right? Different integer. We can contract that notation by just numbering these stresses from 1 to 6 instead of, one, two, three, three, two, three, one, one, two. Okay? And we can do the same thing for strings. So this is useful for programming and for other certain kinds of things. Okay? All right. So Hooke's Law said the stress is equal to the modulus times the strain. That was true for an isotropic element. But if we actually want to look at a three-dimensional element, general element, we actually would have six stresses, three normal stresses and three shear stresses. Remember, you can look at this and say, well, there's six six normal stresses, right? Sigma one and the opposite. 
sigma 2 and the opposite, and so on. But those are not unique, those are the same. So there's really only three normal stresses. And it looks like there's six shear stresses that go out, tau 1, 2, and tau 2, 1. But remember, shearing stresses are kissing cousins, they have to have the same magnitude at that point, hence tau 1, 2 is equal to tau 2, 1. Therefore, we only have three unique shear strains. So we have three unique normal strain stresses and strains, three unique shear stresses and strains. So we got six values. That means we need six terms in our stiffness matrix. Before, all we had in there was E, but now we've got other stuff. And so we're going to use the constant C for that. Okay? And we're going to call this a stiffness approach to generalizing Hooke's law. You'll notice there are now 36 constants. That's 6 times 6. Usually 36, right? So we have a lot of constants. This is difficult for a lot of folks to deal with, so it would be really nice if we could simplify this without losing too much accuracy. However, so if we investigate further and look at the potential strain energy per unit volume, we find out that the material has to be symmetric, and that actually has the benefit of, if this is symmetric, that means all these shaded terms are the same as the corresponding other terms. So C12 above is equal to C12 below, and so on. This is equal to this, this is equal to this, and so on. So actually, these shaded terms are not unique, and we're down to 21 constants. Phew! Still looks pretty ugly to deal with. If we have a monoclinic material, if we have one plane of symmetry, that material is called monoclinic. That's kind of like, well, if you want to understand what a monoclinic is, I saw one the other day as I was driving down the street. There were a bunch of people outside that could hardly talk. Their throats were, oh, no, that's a different kind of clinic. Never mind the monoclinic. The monoclinic we're talking about is one that has one plane of symmetry and if we have a plane of symmetry, we're actually going to drop these down. We'll find out a lot of these terms are zero, and we're not going to deal with this. We're just going to accept other folks' work on this, and that drops us down to 13 independent constants. Okay? If we have an orthotropic material, then we drop down to nine. More of these go to zero, and we drop to nine independent constants. Woo, it's getting better here. If we have, now, a transversely isotropic material drops this even further, and we drop down to five independent constants. This looks, it looks like this. Now, if you're wondering what this is, uh, I am told that this mountain here is a transversely isotropic material. You can kind of see that also if you take a look at, like, a unidirectional fiber, and you see if it's the same all in this plane, any direction is kind of like it's, uh, homogeneous throughout or isot it's all the same in all directions in this plane and you only have this other direction that's different that would be a transversely isotropic material if you want to understand these different tropics uh, actually Jones's text has a pretty good job of talking about that in a little more detail than I'm doing here if we have an isotropic material it gets even simpler and we drop down to two independent constants. Now, it looks like we have a lot of variables here, but actually these variables are constructed of only two independent constants, and we know what those are, right? E and Poisson's ratio. You actually have E, Poisson's ratio, and G, but only two of them are independent because they're related. Remember that? All right, now we've seen how we get different size, made different sets of independent constants for different types of material coming from a stiffness uh, approach using the C's. We also can do it from a compliance approach. The C values are using when we're calculating stresses by multiplying our C matrix times our strains. Now, if we want to calculate our strains, we can just take the inverse of that C matrix. Or we can use the compliance matrix, which we're going to use the little values S for each term. So the compliance matrix times the stress is equal to the strain, or the 
or the C matrix times the strain is equal to stress. We can use either approach, and if you use a compliance matrix approach, these are your equations. Got that? So, so far, what do you need to know? Well, you need to know that when we deal with a three-dimensional element, we're going to have a lot more algebra to do. However, if we make some simplifications, and if we have a material that falls into certain categories, and we're mostly going to be dealing with either isotropic or orthotropic lamina, then actually our job gets a little easier, because we're going to have fewer independent constants. We still have a big honking 6 by 6 matrix, which is challenging for many analysts to deal with. But we're going to simplify that further in a moment. So stay tuned. Before that, let's take a look at our coupling of the matrix. This is our general relation. Remember, this is analogous to Hooke's law, or it is Hooke's law for the generalized state. Stress equals, before it was just E times epsilon, and now it's this matrix C times epsilon, where epsilon has six potential values, and the stresses have six potential values. If we take a look at this, we find out these terms here are called extension coupling terms because they couple the uh, strain, extensional strain, with its corresponding stress. As you can see, this C11 term gets multiplied by epsilon 1. So if epsilon 1 changes, sigma 1 changes. So it's coupling extensional strain with the corresponding normal stress, okay? In the same way, C22 couples epsilon 2 with sigma 2 and C33, epsilon 3 with sigma 3. If we look down here at these three terms, we see that these couple shear with like shear. This 4-4 term couples, if we apply a gamma 2-3, it will affect our stress 2, 3. If we apply a gamma 3, 1, it affects, because of C5, 5, our stress 3, 1. Since this couples shear strain with its corresponding shear stress, these are called the shear coupling terms. Okay? Now, if we look at these ones, these are a little different. Now, if you take a look at C12, you'll notice it gets multiplied by epsilon 2. That means it couples, if you change, if you have a strain in the two direction, now that's an extensional strain, it affects the stress in the one direction. So it's extension, extension coupling, but it's extension coupling with a different direction. So these are called extension, extension coupling, these three terms. And same thing down in here, okay? These terms here are coupling shear with shear. So this 4-5 term says that if we have any strain in the 2-3, it's going to affect our stress in the 2-3. Because this 4-5 term gets multiplied. It's the fifth term, 2-3, 4, 5. That means it's going to multiply by the 1, 2, 3. Excuse me. It's the 3-1 term. It gets multiplied by the fifth term here. What that C45 does. Now, if you look at the next terms, these are called shear shear coupling because they couple the shear with uh, a different shear. So let's say we have a shear strain gamma 3 1. If we apply a shear strain, now take a look at this, that 4-5 term is the fifth term, right? 4-5. That means it gets multiplied by the 1, 2, 3, 4, fifth element. So what that does is say if this changes, it's going to affect this stress. Okay? And what this one says, if this changes, it's going to affect this stress. What this one says... This is the sixth term. If this changes, it's going to affect this stress, and so on. And we also have terms down in here. So what these are doing is they're saying, if there's a shear strain, these terms, if there's a, if this is non-zero, 
then the corresponding shear strain will affect this stress. So a shear strain in another direction affects the shear stress in another direction. Another way to say that the shear strain in one direction affects the shear stress in another direction. Therefore, it's not like leg -like coupling, even though it is shear shear coupling, so we call them the shear shear coupling terms. These terms here, <coughs> these terms here, you'll notice, for example, C14, that's going to mean that anything, if, that if this is non zero, then this shear strain will affect this stress. So a shear strain will affect no extensional stresses. Therefore, these are called extension coupling terms. Same thing with these down here. This actually can be quite hard to predict. But if we see a non-zero term, that's going to cause extension shear coupling. So you want to kind of ruminate on this chart and the relationships. When we talk about coupling, what we're saying is anytime one of these values is zero, like let's say this value here is zero, that means that this stress will not be affected by the second this shear stress will not be affected by this extensional strain. But if this term is non-zero, then these are coupled together. That's what we mean by coupling. Okay? All right. So remember, uh, if we go back to our compliance relationship, if we do a little more research, we would find out that these are the entries in our compliance matrix for a orthotropic material. That means the stress 1 multiplied by 1 over epsilon 1 gives us, right, coupled with the other terms, we multiply this times this, gives us this first strain. These are the entries for a compliance matrix. Correspondingly, these are the entries for the stiffness matrix. Now you'll notice these terms in the compliance matrix look a lot easier to calculate than these terms in the stiffness matrix. But you guys have fancy calculators and you can do it. So for this reason, some people prefer a compliance approach since the equations are a little easier. However, a lot of us are more comfortable dealing with a stiffness relationship because we've done so much F equals KX kind of work. And uh, so for that reason, that's going to be the primary focus of this course, although you can do this either way. Okay. What this chart is doing, we saw back when we were dealing with our structures one class that this relationship is true for isotropic materials. And from this relationship, we found that Poisson's ratio has to be greater than minus one. We also looked at a hydrostatic pressure load and summing our strains, and we defined the bulk modulus, and from that relation we found that Poisson's ratio had to be less than a half. So for isotropic materials, we know that Poisson's ratio needs to be between minus one and plus one half. Okay? If we have a non-isotropic material, then our, uh, Poisson's ratio might fall outside of that range, and it certainly won't fall in quite the same well-behaved. You know, before we saw almost everything has Poisson's ratio of like 0.33 or 0.3, somewhere in there. Where with orthotropic materials, we're going to see more deviations from that. However, we're often going to still be in this range, although you can find that run into materials that are outside this range. Okay? All right, let's go back to our little element. Remember, we've been dealing with a three-dimensional element, and that gave us kind of an ugly matrix. It gave us a six-by-six six matrix. But if we have one direction unloaded, let's say the third direction, as we see in this picture, the third direction is not loaded. A lot of engineering structures like this. In fact, a lot of Structures have axial members that really only take one directional load. But then anytime we have skins and things, we often have loads in a plane, two directions of loads. So a lot of our materials will fall in either the one or two directional kind of uh, 
loading which is su su uh, sufficient to calculate it. This is going to actually make our job easier. So let's take a look at this if one of our stresses is zero. Not only are the normal stresses zero, but the shear stresses on those faces are zero, like they would have to be if we have a thin skin or like many aerospace parts. Now, if that's true, then that's going to give us a strong benefit. Now, there's one other thing we can do, assume, since these materials are thin. Now, remember Poisson's ratio says that if we start extending this like this, we're going to get influences from the thickness. But if the material is really thin, then the then that other direction won't affect the strains. Like let's say we pull it in the in the x direction, then the strains in the z direction won't affect the x strains. And if we pull in the y direction, the z thickness is so small it won't really affect those stresses or strains. So if we assume this is a plain stress element, a thin thin element, then actually we're going to simplify it also. So we're assuming we have a very thin element, so we don't have to worry about Poisson's ratio from that other direction affecting things. And we have zero stress on that one face. And now we return to our 6 by 6 relationship for our orthotropic element, and it looks like this. This was our full relation. Now this relation will handle, that we've written here, will handle a 3D element that's orthotropic. But because we have these zero stresses, and because we're assuming it's, that means these zero stresses, anything that gets multiplied by a zero stress is going to be flown straight to hell and will be zero. And that means that's going to simplify our job significantly. Let's take a look at that. So that sigma 3 being zero is going to eliminate the effects of that row and that column. The tau 2, 3 being 0 is going to eliminate that row and column. Tau 3, 1 is going to eliminate that row and column since it's 0. If you look at this, and then this other, these other, what's left out here is all 0. Therefore, we're really left with a 3 by 3 matrix, which we can write like this. This is the compliance way of writing it. And... Now we're down to a 3 by 3 matrix. It's still a matrix, but this is easy to handle and we can handle it. The entries in that matrix are given down here. So we can just calculate them directly. Now if we had followed a stiffness approach, we would follow the same method. We'd start with our 6 by 6 and we would start eliminating the rows and columns due to the zero stress. And... When we were done, we'd be able to write a 3 by 3 matrix, which fully defines the behavior with the slight error of our assumptions. And our terms of that matrix are a little more complicated than for the compliance, but they're still very calculatable. That is our relationship. This is the basic relationship that we're going to be using for laminates. Now, we've been talking about a lot of things and teaching a lot of concepts, and you're probably a little bit on overload. But come back to Earth, because this is something we're going to do over and over. We're going to have a lamina. We're going to go look up the properties for the lamina. That means the E1, the E2, and the Poisson's ratio 1, 2, and the G1, 2. We're going to use those constants to calculate this stiffness matrix Q. We're going to call this whole matrix Q. That's three by three matrix. We've got six terms, nine terms, and uh, five of them are non-zero. And we're going to use that matrix to relate strains on the lamina to stresses, and stresses to strains. Now what this will handle is if the loads are aligned with the principal material directions. This is for an orthotropic lamina, and this will handle when loads are applied in the orthotropic directions. We can actually do quite a bit just with this form of the equation. We're going to get the properties. We're going to calculate the Q terms. We're going to develop the matrix. And now we can relate stresses to strain, strains to stresses and stresses to strains. We're going to do this over and over. Now, we're also... <coughs> Later, 
next lecture, we will learn how to deal with it when the loads are not aligned with the principal directions. And that's going to make this even more general. We're going to need to know that too. But we're going to come back to this because all of our properties, our stiffnesses, and our allowables are all in the principal directions. So we're going to be coming from principal directions into other directions, and then we're going to end up coming back to principal directions when we evaluate the magnitude of the stresses. So we need to be masters of calculating the Q's, the Q matrix, so we can relate the strains in the lamina to the stresses in the lamina, and vice versa. Got it? Important slide. Okay. By the way, this is a good time to remind you, during these lectures and during our lectures in class, if you're in my class, you want to have your handbook out and you should be highlighting your book as we go, stopping the video and highlighting your book and writing notes to yourself and clarifying things to yourself and putting tabs in your book. This will make your book much more accessible so you can efficiently and quickly find the methods. My book is deliberately concise so that you can quickly navigate to appropriate practical analysis. And it will be even more powerful for you if you have this with tabs and highlights and notes to yourself. Okay? If you're in my class, that will be invaluable because on tests and quizzes, you're going to want to quickly navigate because I'm not going to give you a whole lot of time. I'm going to expect you to know the material, quickly find what you need, and put it on the paper to show me you understand what we're doing. If you're an industry professional or a student somewhere else, uh, just doing this for fun, you may not need to be that quick. However, you're going to find that even after studying this material, you're going to develop a certain level of expertise, and it's going to ebb and wane over the course of your career. And when you come back to doing an analysis that at one time you were better at, it's very reassuring to have your book all highlighted with your notes to yourself. You go, oh, yeah, I remember I was here before. I used to understand this. I can still do this. It will still really help you to be an effective engineer. So have your book out, highlight it, and mark it as you go. Okay? All right, so we did that for uh, orthotropic materials. We can do the same exact thing for isotropic materials, and our result is identical except that our constants are a little simpler. See that? A little simpler constants. We can see now that we're just dependent on E and Poisson's ratio and G. Okay? So that's our approach. We're going to be treating each lamina is going to be either isotropic or orthotropic. And then we're going to do all kinds of magic beyond that. With that simplification, we're going to do a lot of very practical and very useful engineering. Let's take a look a little further for a unidirectional lamina to just kind of set our minds here. Uh, these pictures are out of Jones. And he will go into uh, perhaps more explanation on this. But if we just take a look at this, we assume that these fibers, this unidirectional uh, element of a lamina, all the fibers are in one direction, which means basically, and we have it so uniformly distributed, so basically the properties is basically almost identical, basically identical in the two direction and the three direction are basically identical. Only the one direction is different. This is a standard orthotropic material. And uh, we're actually a monoclinic material, right? So if we look at this, and if we pull on it with a stress in the two direction, we can see it's going to behave in the same way that if we had pulled it in the three direction. Therefore, E2 is equal to E3. Okay? And in the same way... We can see because of that, Poisson's ratio 3, 1 is equal to Poisson's ratio 2, 1. Now, if you take a look at this element and you look at a shear strain, and we apply a shear stress on the thing, we'll notice that actually the way it responds to that shear stress in the 1, 2 plane is the same as it does in the 1, 3 plane 
and hence we can say that G13 is equal to G12. Okay? It's kind of interesting uh, uh, ideas for building our understanding. Okay, the next thing we can drill down is Poisson's ratio. Now remember before, when we are dealing with isotropic materials, we said that Poisson's ratio was equal to the negative of the strain in some direction relative to the strain where the loading is applied. Another easier way of maybe thinking about this is if we have, if we apply a stress and we get a strain, say in the I direction, and we get a strain, and then we're going to get a strain in that direction, and if we multiply that by negative of Poisson's ratio, that's going to tell us how much strain is in the other direction. And so we can write that in a more general sense by writing Poisson's ratio IJ is equal to the negative strain in the J over strain in the I, where that strain in the I, the direction of loading. So if the, you're loading in the X direction, then our this is going to be Poisson's ratio XJ, and it's going to be equal to negative epsilon J over epsilon X. If we're pulling in the one direction, this would be Poisson's. Or let's say we want to know, let's say we're relating the one direction to the two direction. If we're pulling on the one direction, that means Poisson's ratio 1, 2 is equal to negative strain in the 2 over strain in the 1. That's how we use this, okay? We can drill that down further by looking at this. We see, okay, we apply a stress in the one direction. We're getting a strain in the one direction, and we're getting a complementary strain in the two direction according to Poisson's ratio. We can write the stress in the one direction like this. We can write the stress in the two direction like this. And we can write the deflection like that. And if we put these together, we get this equation, right? And in the two direction, we can write the deflection that way. We did all this in our structures one class. If we pull this in the y direction, we're going to get an obvious strain in the y direction according to this equation. And we're going to need a complementary strain in the other direction, in the one direction, according to this equation. And since deflection is just uh, the uh, the strain is just length deflection over original length, we can write it like this and like this. Now, if we combine these two sets of equations, we find out that the Poisson's ratio on the one two is related to Poisson's ratio on the two one by this relation. Another way to write this. Since we're often going to be given Poisson's ratio 1, 2 when we go looking at properties, we're going to need to be able to calculate Poisson's ratio 2, 1. And simply, Poisson's ratio 1, 2 times the ratio of E2 over E1. Okay? Great. Make sure you understand that, because we're going to need to use this little relation here. Whether you track with all this precisely is not as critical as understanding this equation and being able to fetch it when you need it. Okay? Our properties, uh, this, these are properties out of call, and these are the same uh, kind of properties I put in your appendix. So we're going to, let's say we have a lamina, and we're going to be doing some analysis on it. We're going to be relating stresses to strain. We're going to go look up this property of the lamina, whether we're talking U.S. or SI units. And you'll notice we've got the, the longitudinal modulus E1 and E2 and Poisson's ratio 1, 2 and the shear modulus and more stuff. And we're going to use those to calculate our Qs. And we're going to use those Qs to construct our Q matrix so we can relate stresses to strains. You'll notice, though, there's no Poisson's ratio 2 to 1. And, and the Q, when we were calculating our big Q, we needed Poisson's ratio 2 to 1 as well as 1 2. But, as we saw, we have this relation so we can calculate our Poisson's ratio 2 to 1 from Poisson's ratio 1 2. Don't forget it. In fact, you might want to write this little relation in your uh, handbook, right where these properties are. Okay? So just to practice a little bit, if we take a look at this matrix, C12, C12 is right here. This is getting multiplied by epsilon 2, 
So that term is coupling epsilon 2 with sigma 1. This is an extension extension coupling term because it's coupling this strain with another different extensional stress. If we look at 2, 4, that is relating stress in the 2 direction with shear strain to 3. So this is a shear extension coupling term. 5, 2 is relating shear stress 3, 1 with normal strain epsilon 2. That's another shear extension coupling term. And 6, 1 is relating shear stress 1, 2 with normal strain 1. That's another shear extension coupling term. And 6, 6 is coupling tau 1, 2 with gamma 1, 2. That is a shear coupling term. It's coupling shear strain with its corresponding shear stress. Okay? That's what we talked about before, and that's just refreshing our memory on how that works. Here's a little example. Let's say we have a unidirectional lamina, and we want to calculate all these things. Let's start by calculating the compliance matrix. We're going to go to the back of our book, and we're going to find the properties of our uh, of our lamina. Let's say that these are the properties of lamina we want to use. And this is our relationship. And we're, caught, we're asking for the compliance matrix. Uh, so this is the relationship we're looking for. We can calculate our terms, flip to our book and the appropriate page, calculate these two terms, uh, three terms, excuse me, plug those in, and now we can relate strains to stresses. That gives us this. Okay? This is already the reduced stiffness matrix for this lamina. Now, if we want uh, Poisson's uh, ratio, then remember this, the minor Poisson's ratio. We can use this relation to calculate the minor Poisson's ratio. No problem. We then can look at the reduced stiffness matrix. We calculate our Q's. Normally, would we would not calculate both Q's and compliance terms. We do one or the other. That gives us our stress-strain relationship from a stiff, stiffness approach. If we want to calculate our strains in the 1-2 direction for a element, if our if our unidirectional element is given these, if these loads or stresses are applied to it, then what we do, we've got these two relations. Which relation do you think we want to use? This relation or this relation? Well, we can actually use either because we have our little handy calculator and it can do make surface operations. We can actually solve this system of equations using the first equation. Or we can just multiply the compliance matrix times our stresses. That's actually a little easier. If we go with that approach, we can actually do this by hand. And we would do that like this. Or you can pop, put that matrix, those two matrices, the matrix and the column vector in your calculator and multiply those out with the same effect. We can say the stress, the strain in the one direction is 15.69 times 10 to the minus 6. The strain in the two direction is minus 249.4 times 10 to the minus 6, or micrometers per meter. Or we can write those together like this as a little column matrix. So, that is our third lecture. We look deeper at all the statuses for a three-dimensional material element. We have broken that down and see how it, how it simplifies as we go from anisotropic to isotropic behavior. We focused on isotropic and orthotropic lamina, because those are the ones we're going to be dealing with the most, with most engineering analysis, and that's what we're going to be dealing with in this class. We then found, we made another simplification of saying that the it was all loaded in plane, and the three face was unloaded, no stress, and we said it was thin. So we got Poisson's effects are eliminated, 
and that dropped us from a 6x6 to a 3x3 matrix. We then defined the terms for both the stiffness matrix and the compliance matrix, which we called Q and, and S. Now, originally we used the general term C, but then we broke it down to simplify. We called it Q, because a lot of the books are using big Q for that. So we've got the Qs and the Ss. We can calculate those terms. And because we have those terms, we can relate stresses to strains as long as our loads are applied in a principal material direction. That's either the one direction or the two direction. Okay? If they're not applied in those, or, or both, right? They can have a stress in the one direction, a stress in the two direction, and a shear strain, a shear stress. All three can be applied at once. We just can't have a loading, shear or normal, applied in a non-principal direction. In order to do that, we're going to need to wait till the next lecture. We'll find out how to deal with that. Enjoy.